When I was playing football growing up, there was, played our games on Friday nights in high school, and there was always one moment of the game that was the most exciting for me. It was not kickoff. It was not when our team got the ball for the first time. It wasn't the last two minutes of the fourth quarter when all would be decided. No, there was a a moment before all of those things that to me was the most exciting of all when the anticipation of what was to come would build up to a fever pitch when the butterflies that would churn in your stomach would get to going the most. You know when it was? It was actually when we would come out of the field house and the cheerleaders would raise the big paper banner and we would all huddle together as a team behind it. I mean, that was the moment that anything could happen. It was the most pregnant moment that there was. Part of it, frankly, we weren't a very good football team. And so we didn't win a lot. But in that moment, anything could happen. And the team captain would get us together and he'd break us down and would go through our war chant and then we would rip through that banner and run as fast as we could down the sidelines. Now, when you get to the scripture passage this morning and you start reading about John the Baptist, I kind of think it's that sort of a moment for the Jewish people that are out there. It doesn't say that they went in dribs and drabs. They didn't go by twos or threes. It said that there were crowds going out there to John. Crowds. And so the question for me is, what were they going out to see? What were they going out to experience? Well, if you want to understand in the Jewish mind how things like deliverance and salvation are really understood, there is a phrase that you have to come to grips with that you really have to wrap your mind around. And that phrase is what it means to pass through the waters. Okay? To pass through the waters. In the Jewish mind, it is really situated at a deep level. I, I'm even tempted to say at the level of your bones that back the, the pivotal moment in the history of the Israelites goes all the way back to the moment of the Exodus. It goes back to the moment when the Jewish people, the Hebrews, were crying out under slavery to Pharaoh and God raised them up a prophet to deliver them. Not John the Baptist in this case, but the prophet Moses. And Moses confronted Pharaoh, and then he took the people, and they began to leave Egypt, and they came to the point where they were standing on the banks of the Red Sea. And at that point, they were between the proverbial rock and a hard place. They had Pharaoh's army behind them. They had the expanse of the Red Sea in front of them, and they were in desperate circumstances. It was at that moment that the Lord saw fit to part the waters of the Red Sea and allow the people to, here's the phrase, to pass through the waters. In order to do that, they had to go way down below the surface of the sea. And yet, even though they were many feet below the surface of the sea, by the grace of God, every step that they took was on dry land. And by that means, they were delivered. Now, that was deliverance. That wasn't yet salvation, because once they got to the other side, what they found was that the vast expanse of the Red Sea had been replaced by the vast expanse of the wilderness. And so, over the course of the next 40 years, they wandered, and then they camped. And then they wandered, and then they camped. Until finally, they found themselves at the shoreline of another body of water. This time, the body of water that was in front of them was the River Jordan. Now, here's the thing about the River Jordan. It ain't no Red Sea, okay? That's an actual picture of it. I mean, in some places, it's as much like a large creek as it is a river. It's not hundreds of miles across. It's a few feet across. It's not dozens of feet deep. It's just a few feet deep. The people could have made their way across the river on their own. But God had something for them in that moment, just as he had something for them 
when their ancestors were at the shoreline of the Red Sea. He wanted them to experience what it meant to pass through the waters. Now, they themselves, as they stood there looking across the river into the promised land, they weren't the ones who had gone through the Red Sea. That generation of people had already died and and gone away. That was their parents and their grandparents. But just as on baptism of the Lord Sunday, we are meant to call to mind our baptism, and in that sense, remember it, even if we don't literally remember it. On that day, on the shores or on the banks of the River Jordan, God wanted the people to call to mind the fact that they and their ancestors had crossed the Red Sea 40 years prior. The Lord wanted them to understand that the chapter that they were writing There at the Jordan, before they entered into the land of promise, was the final chapter of a story that had begun at the Red Sea. And just as God had delivered them on the day of the Exodus, so God was saving them into the promised land by allowing them to once again pass through the waters. This idea of deliverance and salvation through passing through the waters is something that got so deep into the spiritual DNA of the Israelites that whenever the prophets and the generations and even the centuries that followed wanted to talk about what it meant for God to deliver his people, they would bring this imagery back out. You can see it through the great prophet Isaiah, who when he was attempting to speak a word of hope and a promise to the people, God said through him, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, there it is, I will be with you and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. Okay. So now, fast forward 800 years to the first century A.D., and gather together with the crowds on the banks of the River Jordan in that day to listen to the great prophet John the baptizer preaching in the wilderness. What are the people there to do? What are they there to experience? Well, they are, in a certain sense, by the baptism that John was calling them to, they are there to pass through the waters. They're there to experience salvation. To experience salvation no less than the Hebrews did as they passed through the waters of the Red Sea. To experience salvation no less than their descendants did as they passed through the waters of the River Jordan on their way into the land of promise in the days of Joshua. They were there to experience salvation. We are living in a time, friends, when there is great confusion about this when there is great confusion about what it means to hunger after salvation. We are living in a time, I am tempted to say, of numbness. I've shared with you recently some of the surveys that have come out from organizations like Gallup, from the Barna Research Group, from the Pew Research Council that are charting the decline in church attendance and a faith observance on the part of American people. In a certain sense, this is a decline that dates really back to the 1960s, but it's also one that has increased over the course of the past couple of decades since the turn of this century. There was a new one that came out from the Pew Research Center just a few days ago that has charted this just over the past five years. And one of the things that it points out is that while faith adherence has been declining, it's been declining the most rapidly amongst millennials. In other words, amongst those who are young adults in our culture. The troubling aspect of that, of course, is that if it is declining the quickest amongst millennials, then that would lead you to believe that it's only going to pick up pace in the years ahead because it seems that with each succeeding generation, the grip of faith is lessening. If we wanted to try to explain this, we could try from any number of different angles. We could use any number of of different reasons. We could use any number of different images. I tend and have for a while, I have tended to gravitate towards 
the image of numbness. I've become fascinated, some years ago I became fascinated by stories of people hiking up Mount Everest. I I tend to gravitate towards something and I'll go down a rabbit hole on it as far as I can. And a few years ago it was with John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, about people who choose of their own free will to go to Mount Everest and attempt to climb it. I mean, one of the reasons I think I'm fascinated by this is that it just doesn't make any sense to me. George Lee Mallory's reason for attempting it in the 1920s was famously, because it's there. I don't think that's a good enough reason. People are not meant to live above 27,000 feet. Um, I think another reason why it's so fascinating to me is simply because it is an activity that is, by its very nature, lethal. I mean, every year when people go to climb Mount Everest, there's always a few that don't make it back. I mean, every year there are people who die up on that mountain. And what that means is when they all get to base camp there in Nepal, and they're all, they got their tents set up, and they're all trying to acclimatize, they all get to know each other, and they look around, there's always a few of them that are going to go up that mountain and never come back down. One would think they just all believe that it isn't them, right? I mean, there is a region at the very top, the last couple of thousand feet, that's called the death zone. (laughs) Doesn't sound like the kind of place you'd want to go, does it? When you get up there, people sometimes will begin to experience severe hypothermia. And when they do that, one of the fascinating aspects of the type of hypothermia that they experience is that it creates a level of numbness such that they forget that there's anything wrong with them. If you read Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, he describes the experience of coming upon people who have become so numb that they've sat down and begun to disrobe. They take off their hats. They take off their gloves. Sometimes they'll even take off their coats and their shirts. They are actively dying, but they're so numb that they don't believe that there's anything wrong with them. Internally, they think that they feel just fine. I'm afraid that in our own culture, we've reached that level of numbness. On the one hand, I've, I've told you before, I believe that a lot of this has to do with the influence of media and technology in our world. We are so bombarded every single moment of the day by these little things that attempt to distract us and to claim our attention that it keeps us from having the the long-term focus to be able to, to really pay attention to the things that are important. When we constantly are checking our phones or are dialing into social media. We're getting these little dopamine hits that are keeping us addicted, coming back again and back again and back again, such that we can never really focus on anything at all. We become numb to the things around us. That's the chronic condition that we're in. If you want to look at the acute condition, it can be explained by the circumstances of the pandemic, of course. The pandemic is something that has so narrowed our field of vision that the lens through which we look at everything is a COVID-19 lens. We're constantly meant to be paying attention to infection rates, to being paying attention to risk factors, to be paying attention to vaccine levels, so that every time that we get online to check our favorite news outlet or turn on the television, the top story is always something that has to do with COVID-19. We're meant to pay attention to nothing else. What that means is that we become numb to the world around us. And the truth, the truth is that people in our society are in just as much danger as those climbers are high on Everest. But the thing that is most dangerous to them is not even a virus. The thing that poses the greatest danger is spiritual death. And spiritual death, once experienced, can lead to eternal death. When we look at John the Baptist, we're looking at someone who was out in the wilderness drawing crowds and appears to have been desperate to shake them out of the numbness that their own society and culture had caused them to slip into. 
I mean, here in Luke 3, it tells us about what kind of sermon he was preaching. They were coming out to him in crowds, and he was addressing them as, you brood of vipers. I mean, how's that for building rapport with your audience? Good morning, choir, you brood of vipers. He goes on and he says to them, don't call yourselves children of Abraham. That doesn't do you any good. In other words, the thing that's at the very core of your identity, your Jewishness, it's not going to do any work for you. Anything that's in the past, it doesn't matter anymore. You've got to wake up. You've got to pay attention to what's going on around you. You've got to pay attention to the path in front of you. When he wants to bring his sermon home, he finishes it up with this. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now we're going to get to the part about the baptism of Jesus. I mean, we are celebrating baptism of the Lord Sunday today after all. But before we do, I mean, just look when you skip down a couple of verses and Luke is reflecting back on what it is, the message, what it is that, that, that John has been delivering to the people. And what he says in Luke 3.18 is this. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. See, that's all of this is good news. You brood of vipers. Don't call yourself a child of Abraham. The axe is laid at the fruit of the trees. Luke says, and that was the good news. You know, we all read the Bible through a lens, don't we? If what we really like to, to read is the stories about Jesus ministering to the poor, then we read the Gospels, that's what the Bible is going to be to us. That's what we're going to pay attention to. If what we really like are stories of miraculous healings and of the remarkable spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit will bestow upon believers, then that's the thing that we'll always pay attention to when we read the Scriptures. Or if we're really compelled by mission then it's the stories of Jesus sending the disciples out into the world in mission or in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit anointing people and sending them out into the world in mission. That's what the Bible will be for us. Just for a moment, just for a moment, let's drop all of our favored lenses and just read it for the stark teaching that it gives us. John the Baptist is preaching about axes being laid to the roots of trees and of the trees that don't bear good fruit being thrown into the fire. The metaphor is unmistakable. And yet Luke tells us, and that was all good news. Do you think that it might be the case that what the scriptures are trying to do here is to rattle us out of our numbness? Could that be it? That God is trying to shake us for a moment out of our numbness, trying to get us to open up our eyes to unstop our ears. That very same article that I was talking about that reported the new findings of the Pew Research Council about the decline in church adherence over the past five years and of the fact that the church is losing its grip on millennials the most of all. It goes on to say that what churches and synagogues need to be doing is becoming more culturally relevant. What if... Bear with me for a second. What if the problem is not with the gospel, but the problem is with the culture itself? Because you see, when you get messages that the church or the scriptures or the Christian message needs to be more culturally relevant, what it's saying is the culture's right. The church has got it wrong. So the church, the, the gospel, the message needs to become more worldly in order to conform itself to the culture. What if it's the culture that's the sick one? What if it's the culture that's leading people astray? What if it's the culture that's breaking people down and saddling them with a level of brokenness that none of us can endure forever? What if what our calling should be, like John the Baptist in the wilderness, should be to preach the message with more boldness and less apology than ever we have before. The problem that the world has got is, as the old hymn puts it, the problem of the sin-sick soul. It's the fact 
that people have guilt in their lives. They have brokenness in their lives. They have pain in their lives. And that's something that the world has laid on them. The answer today is the same as it was in the day of John the Baptist. Repent. Get down on your knees. Open up your bag and dump out all your idols and let go of them. Ask for forgiveness from the Lord. And by the Holy Spirit, receive the healing power of his grace. That's the answer. When people came to John the Baptist in the Jordan, what they were doing was repenting. They were saying, we've got it wrong. We need a course correction. They thought John was the answer. The twist that John had on his message was to say, I'm not the answer. You think I'm powerful. You think my preaching makes a difference. Just you wait. What he said was this. He says, I baptize you with water. But one who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandal I am unworthy to untie. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor. He's going to gather the wheat into the barn. But the chaff, he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Here we all stand at the beginning of a new year. And as we do this time every year, in just a few moments, we're going to come forward We're going to call to mind our own baptisms. We're going to call to mind the fact that we have passed through the waters, just like the Hebrews. We have passed through the waters. But the thing is, and the message that John had to bring, is that now the time has come when passing through the waters doesn't bring you into a land that is your salvation, a land of promise. When you pass through the waters from John onward, what you're passing through to reach is a person, and his name is Jesus, and he is the one who can bring you salvation. Our Lord Jesus is desperate to reach every man, every woman, and every child in this world. He wants to reach those millennials who are falling away from the faith. He wants to reach people in our own church and in every church who have, find that, who have found their faith waning during these long, long months of the COVID pandemic. Who, because of what we have endured, what we have suffered under, have found the fires of their own faith died, being, being crushed, being died down. Jesus wants to reach those people. Jesus wants to reach people in lands that have never heard the gospel, who've never heard his name. What he needs most of all are people who are serious about following him. He needs wheat and not chaff. He needs people who are standing on the cusp, like the football players standing behind that banner, ready to be led by their captain to burst through it, to run down and to start the game. He needs people like the Hebrews standing on the banks of the River Jordan ready to pass through the waters into the land of promise. He needs people like you and like me who are determined not to let this world remain in darkness but to light the lamp and to set it upon the stand so that those who are in darkness will know that in Jesus a light has shined. Christian faith and the Christian life is not playtime. It's serious business. And the stakes have never been higher. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.